Hi, this is Remembering the Past with Corey Franklin, the show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're going to start out in Philadelphia. And while people from Chicago and New York and possibly Southern California might argue, Philadelphians insist that their town is the cradle of basketball. And they've turned out some great basketball players there, most notably Will Chamberlain from Overbrook High School and Kobe Bryant from Lower Marion. But another Philadelphia legend died recently at the age of 81, Tom Gola, a nice Polish boy. His real name was Galinsky. Tom Gola was from LaSalle, LaSalle College High School, and then went to LaSalle University. And he was one of the greatest college basketball players of all time. In fact, Will Chamberlain called him the greatest college basketball player he ever saw. He was a tweener. He was 6'6". So he's sort of like Magic Johnson before Magic Johnson. He could do everything, rebound, dribble, score, and play defense. He was a three-time All-American, and IBN and ESPN call him the number 17 greatest college basketball player of all time. Philadelphia native Tom Gola felt right at home at LaSalle. The NCAA's career rebound leader averaged almost 19 per game. He led the Explorers to an NIT and an NCAA championship. Here's NBC Philadelphia on their hometown hero, Tom Gola. I'm John Clark. As we told you earlier, Philly has lost one of its greatest athletes. Tom Gola died today at the age of 81. He was the heart of LaSalle basketball. Here is Tom playing for the Explorers in the 50s. Get this, in a five-year span, he won a national championship, an NIT championship, and an NBA title. One of only two in history to do that. He still has the NCAA record for most rebounds and the record for most combined points and rebounds. LaSalle named its arena after him. He was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame. And tonight, here is former LaSalle coach Speedy Morris. Well, one of the greatest basketball players ever, certainly in, in this area. Uh, you know, he was uh, Magic Johnson before Magic Johnson, the big six foot six guard who also played center. Tom put LaSalle on the map. There's no question it wasn't for Tom Goa. LaSalle wouldn't uh, be as uh, recognizable as they are. He put him on the map a long time ago. Played in the pros with the Philadelphia Warriors. He wasn't as good a player in the pros because of his size, 6'6". Six, six. He had to play against quicker guards and taller forwards. But they won an NBA championship in 1956, and then he went on to play with Will Chamberlain on the Warriors. And they had some great battles with the Celtics, which they never won. Straight to the Knicks, played a couple years with the Knicks, and he made the Basketball Hall of Fame in 1976. He also coached LaSalle, and he was a very good coach, too. As John Clark mentioned, the LaSalle Arena is named Tom Gola Arena. So we say goodbye to number 15, the pride of Philadelphia, Tom Gola. We're going to move on now to Dave Madden, nice Canadian boy who grew up in Terre Haute. He died recently at the age of 83. What was he known for? Well, he was a television comedian, and I'll let the Partridge family tell the story. Come on now and be everybody and hear us sing There's nothing better than being together when we're singing. Five of us and mom working all day. We knew we could help her if our music would pay. Daddy got proven to sell our song and it really came to with yeah, Daddy got Reuben to sell our songs. Dave Madden was Reuben Kincaid, who played the agent for the Partridge family on the show. He had sort of a deadpan expression that came from the 20s, and he had sort of a slapstick approach to comedy, also from the 20s. And his comedy pedigree in television was as a minor star on two 60s shows. The first was the short-lived but pretty funny Camp Ronamuck, where he mostly did physical comedy. <laughs> NBC comedy that was for baby boomers who went to overnight camp in the 60s. But a little later, in the late 60s, he was part of one of the great counterculture shows of the era, Laugh-In. And now, from beautiful downtown Burbank, NBC, the national battling company, trembles under the strain of timidity and nevertheless presents Roman and Martin's Laugh-In 25th anniversary special, starring the right on Dan Rowan. And the even moron, Dick Martin. And in alphabetical order, Ruth Buzzy, Joanne Worley, Judy Karn, Chelsea Brown, Henry Gibson, Teresa Graves, Goldie Hawn, Artie Johnson, Jeremy Lloyd, Dave Madden, Alan Seuss, and Lily Tomlin. 
awfully funny show and obviously a pretty hip cast, many of whom went on to be very famous, even if they did steal that line about the moron from their rival show, The Smothers Brothers. Again, on Rowan and Martin's Laughing, Dave Mann was a minor character. He mostly did physical bits. Of course, with that cast, it was hard to get a major role, but occasionally he got his lines in. I don't know if I told you, but I spend every winter in a nudist camp where we're allowed to wear boots and earmuffs. You know, it's really amazing how many places you can wear earmuffs. Yeah, that's your typical laugh in one liner. But his career was made in the early 70s when he got the gig on the Partridge family, opposite Shirley Jones, who was a major music star of the 50s and 60s, one of the great stars who just read her autobiography, and David Cassidy, who became one of the top singing stars of the early 70s. He's fallen on a little bit of hard times these days. But nevertheless, he was a huge talent in the early 70s. Besides playing the agent for the Partridge family, Dave Mann also was sort of a foil for Danny Bonaducci, the bad boy of the show. And in real life, he befriended Bonaducci and took him in for a while. Bonaducci had his own sort of personal issues. He was sort of like Conrad Bain and Todd Bridges, who we talked about before. Danny Bonaducci, by the way, went on to be a DJ in Chicago here for a while. That's before he moved back to L.A. and became a DJ there and got involved with wrestling and other pastimes. So, but it was a nice story at the time. And that's a tale for another day. Let's get back to the Partridge family. Here's a little bit of Dave Madden as Reuben Kincaid. He's at a barbecue. He's cooking out and a temporary love interest enters his life. You also get the obligatory interplay between him and Danny Bonaducci. Anybody for another Reuben burger? No, thank you. But I must say, those were the best hamburgers I've ever tasted. This isn't exactly the best hamburger I've ever tasted. But that must have been the one I dropped. <laughs> Shirley tells me you're in business for yourself now. Yes. I, I manufacture cosmetics. Oh, that's wonderful. Kathleen. Yeah, that's been a favorite name of mine since, since I read the book. Kathleen the Great. Pass the pickle, please. I think you must mean Catherine the Great. Huh? Well, in the Reader's Digest version, they shortened it to Kathleen. <laughs> Ruben, would you pass Danny the pickles, please? Oh, my cake. I brought a cake. Uh, strawberry cream. I love strawberry cream. Okay, I grant you it's not Shakespeare, but it made for a good career for Dave Madden. He didn't do much after that. He had a recurring role on the show Alice for a while, but it wasn't as memorable as Reuben Kincaid. He remained friends with all the laugh-in people, and he wrote his memoirs about the Partridge family in his autobiography, Reuben on Rye, which I've heard is a pretty good book. So we say goodbye to Dave Madden. We're going to close tonight with Claudio Abbato, who died recently at the age of 80. And Claudio Abbato was one of the great symphony conductors of the 20th century. He was Italian, but he conducted many of the world's greatest orchestras. He was the principal conductor of the London Symphony Orchestra for a while. In 1989, it looked like he would get the gig here in Chicago. He was the odds-on favorite, but for some reason he never got it. I don't know why. So after that, he went on at the end of his career to conduct the Berlin Philharmonic. Here's the story of Claudio Abbado from Matthew Bannister on BBC Four's Last Word. Claudio Abbado was one of the most respected conductors of his generation. He led many of the world's greatest orchestras, including the Berlin Philharmonic, La Scala in Milan, and the London Symphony Orchestra. He was also principal guest conductor of the Chicago Symphony and worked at the Vienna State Opera. His repertoire was wide-ranging, from opera to the great symphonic works, and from baroque to contemporary music. He was modest and self-effacing and rarely gave interviews, but in 1980 he spoke to Roy Plumley on Desert Island Discs. First, about his childhood. My father is born in Alba, in Piemonte, north of Italy, and my mother is from Sicily. But further back? Yes, the origin of my name is Arab. My father was a violinist. Yes. My mother played piano. Not surprisingly, the young Claudio began his musical studies on violin and piano with his parents. But as a teenager, it was his organ playing that got him into trouble. When I was 15, 16 years old, where I was studying composition and I was playing organ to get some money. I was playing. Sometimes not only Bach's sonata or, or fugue or prelude, but I was playing Matthew's Passion and the organ. But I didn't know when I have to stop for the mass. 
So I was playing for hours and hours, and so the boys come to me to say, "Now you stop!" But I say, "No, I have to finish the piece." <laughs> so that the result was I have to change the church. Although Claudio Abbado presided over some of the world's most prestigious orchestras, he was also committed to helping young people to make music. In 1976, he became the first conductor of the European Community Youth Orchestra. That's something I think great. The wonderful young musician in, in all Europe. And now it's really getting fantastic because the first year was a good orchestra. I remember we played Mark Six Symphony, and that's a very difficult piece. They played very well. Uh, I think the spirit of this orchestra is something unique. There's no limit. But however complex the music he was conducting, Abado often worked without a score. I like to have contact with the orchestra, with the stage, with the singer. And also psychologically for me, it's very important to know by heart. Do you think it ever worries singers or musicians? No, I think in the contrary, that you can help if you look a musician, if you look a uh, singer. <laughs> Memories of Claudio Abado, who's died aged 80. What other show is going to give you that and the Partridge family? Long-time listeners of this show know how much I love opera, so I think we're going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer, Sid Tepps. And in closing tonight, we're going to have the European Chamber Orchestra conducted by Claudio Abado playing Prokofiev's Classical Symphony. Sorry, opera buffs, no closing opera tonight. <laughs> Thank you.